Hey, this is Matthew Ma. Welcome to the Truth About Real Estate podcast. Today, we're talking to home renovation expert, Van Sturgeon. Van is an experienced entrepreneur who has successfully created several businesses in the real estate industry involving land acquisition, development, construction, and renovation. He's passionate about helping homeowners and real estate investors overcome their fears of house renovations. Welcome, Van. Glad to have you on our show. Thank you very much, Matthew, uh, for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, having a great conversation with you. Perfect. And you know, earlier you mentioned too, right now you're in Toronto, but you've been in Chicago, you've been in Florida, um, you've done renovation for over 30 years. I'm excited to hear about that story and like how you became all about it. Sure. Well, I, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a tad older than you. I'm a, I'm a product of the 60s and I was uh, born and raised in Chicago. Uh, my immigrant parents, uh, uh, we lived on the north side of Chicago with my little brother uh, in a one-bedroom apartment. And like the hopes and aspirations of a lot of immigrants who come to the, you know, to, to this great country is that, uh, you know, you save up your money to be able to eventually buy that dream home and live the, uh, live the dream. And that's what my parents were doing and uh, scurrying all their monies to, uh, off to the side. And then what ended up happening was they, they learned – uh, that the apartment building that they were living in had gone up for sale. So instead of actually running out and becoming uh, the, uh, be, you know, chasing that, that dream home, they actually became landlords. And so they, they put all their monies together and borrowed some from friends and family and they put the down payment and they purchased uh, this apartment building uh, in the late 70s. And it was a That's building, uh, it, it, it was a great investment in that uh, it was. Uh, it was uh, an apartment building that was fully occupied and it made a lot of sense financially. But unfortunately, uh, Matthew, and you're too young to remember, but those late seventies turned into being very difficult times. Uh, the economy started to suffer dramatically. There's high interest rates uh, at 18, 20 some odd percent. Unemployment rate was high, sky high. Durant hostage situation. It was just a miserable period of time. And what you began to see was a migration, not only in Chicago, but in a lot of the major metropolitan cities across that time of good people leaving and running off to the suburbs. And uh, that's what ended up happening. So all of a sudden, this apartment building that was fully occupied started to suffer 30, 40, 50, 60 percent vacancy. And then and that was a region, a reason or a function of just the neighborhood deteriorating. You started to see gangbangers and prostitutes and drugs and all that kind of stuff uh, coming into the neighborhood. And it was just a very difficult time. And I, I can remember walking up and down my neighborhood and you would see uh, buildings that were torched, that were literally uh, uh, put on fire uh, so that the landlords could make, could get their, uh, could get the insurance company to pay money to them to, to, to close up their, you know, because it was just a miserable time. They couldn't survive. So as a family, we had to do what we could to, serve, to keep that investment going. And we, we did everything ourselves from painting, plastering, drywall, uh, replacing carpet, refinishing, refinishing hardwood floors, whatever it took to get done, we did it ourselves because we just couldn't afford to hire anybody to do it. And it's through that background is how I got exposed to renovations, construction, and real estate investing. And I went off to university, uh, graduated. I had some aspirations of being a lawyer, and uh, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get past the, 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 the power and the love that I had for construction renovations. And so I broke the bad news to my parents that I wasn't going to become a lawyer. You know, like every parent's got their hopes and dreams to have their kid, you know, walk around with a suit and tie. Um, and I told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, open up my own company, be a general contractor. And so that's what I did. I, I got started in the late 80s in Chicago, out on a hustle, trying to drum up as much business as I could. And I slowly repaired time. I started to build uh, a client list of people that uh, I was doing work for. And ultimately, what I ended up co coming, I kept bumping into were these same guys, you know, see the same people who were real estate investors who are buying and flipping properties who are buying and adding to their portfolios as rental properties. And I started to see more and more of this. And, and I said, you know what, this is something that I would like to try as well. And so uh, as I was growing, developing my general contracting business, I uh, offshoot and I started doing real estate as well. I was doing real, I was doing first, I got started doing flips and then eventually moved on to buy and hold like a buy and hold strategy. So 
Uh, I've been very blessed and fortunate over the last 30 years to have done many, many different things. I've won many, many different hats from building homes to property management to restoration work. You know, those kind of fellows you see hanging off a, off an apartment building 20, 25 stories high up in the air. Those are kind of, that I have a company that actually does that, has, does heavy duty restoration work. So nice. I've, I've got a wide variety of experiences in, in the, I'm right now in that semi retirement stage of my life where I you know, took a lot of toll uh, on, on the body and the mind in developing these businesses because I was really focused on it. And uh, right now, I just spend my time helping new, uh, real estate investors in figuring it out all out. There's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of uh, there, you know there's a lot of apprehension and anxiety. People understand the value of investing in real estate and purchasing properties, but there's a lot of there's obviously a lot of anxiety when you're making these big ticket purchases, especially when you're renovating. Let's talk about this. So let's break this back down. So in the beginning, too, you mentioned you know your parents like when they were renters, they went from being a renter to being a landlord, not even being a homeowner. They skipped bypass that and went to becoming a landlord like how did they get started on that and like what made them think to, hey i want to become a landlord i was a renter but now i want to be a landlord ultimately uh for every for them and for all real estate investors it's really a numbers game it's mm -hmm. it's it's the what you can acquire the property for what does it require in terms of renovations rehabs and at the end of the day you're borrowing money and the cost of the money and the overhead is to justify making that investment in a property Back but in normally, those days, pardon me? normally when you when, normally when you start and you know like like something triggers them to say, hey, I want to become a landlord and I want to start investing. Numbers make sense, but as somewhere like did they have a background in real estate already, or did they someone like show them kind of the path to start doing this that it financially made sense and go ahead and jump into it, even though interest rates are eighteen percent, you know? No, I didn't have anybody in the way of mentoring them or coaching them. Uh, what ended up uh, was they, they, my father did just a, just did the arithmetic, uh, in figuring it out and, and, you know, the numbers made sense. And so as a result, they decided to go forward. And at that time, when he walked in, it was a building that was fully occupied and it didn't have that, you know, that kind of massive turnover. So a lot of the things that needed to be done, it was a relatively also newer building uh, when they purchased it. So right. the, the capital improvements associated with it and the expenses were all palpable. And mm -hmm. as a result, they made a decision. And it was a great decision. But fortunately, nobody saw, foresaw the turmoil that a lot of cities underwent or across the country went through during that period of time. It was just, uh, Matthew, it was just a miserable period of time. As a, you know, go, growing up in that period, I can tell you that it was palpable. Like you can, you can feel it. It, it was not, a, it was just not a good time. And unfortunately, uh, it, they they got into it at that period and and they had to do what they had to do in order to uh to be able to survive and that's actually good in a way that for example you guys learn how to do like the home renovations in inside and take care of everything yourself because you learn a lot more from that you get more appreciation and you have a better understanding of everything that really goes deeply into doing renovations well there's a there's an interesting line that i i, re I read recently from tony robbins where something along the lines of that if you really want to accomplish something it's two th you need two things either desperation or inspiration mm -hmm. it's one of those two and under those circumstances uh my parents uh needed they, they it was desperation there, there was no alternatives. Uh, they had sunk everything they could in that investment and they had to do everything they could to be able to survive. And so they had to learn how to paint walls and do the work necessary to be able to hold on to the investment. And as a family, we did it. We did it all. Yeah, even I think even nowadays, like more and more people, since the cost of buying real estate is so expensive, a lot of people are actually spending time into, you know, doing some of the self renovations as much as they can because contractors are really limited supply, uh, materials are really limited, and, you know, just the cost is extraordinary in some, some most markets. Well, it, it, there's uh, obviously there's that there's that trend has been go ongoing for a while now. You, you know, there's channels dedicated to, you know, DIYs and YouTube and all that kind of stuff that's out there. I, I, I suggest, I strongly suggest to people that if you really want to get into this as a serious business uh, venture, meaning you want to create a real estate portfolio that you can create passive income and eventually get to the point where you're financially free, uh, that that is not really the approach that you should take because there's so many things that co could go wrong in a DIY that Hollywood doesn't want to talk about. Yeah. Like they go through these romanticized these renos 
these demo, you know, these things that they do in these properties without actually going into the, you know, if you get into the minutiae, if you get into the weeds of these types of things, it's not easy to demo a house. And I've been walked into, like, I've literally done thousands of renovations in my lifetime over a span of 30 years from apartments to houses to buildings. And there's so many things that go, can go wrong where I've walked into properties where they process of, they've started the, the, they started a renovation, they started demoing. And a house is literally teetering, ready to fall up, to collapse on itself because a couple of low bearing walls were removed because they want that open concept without realizing you can't just remove walls. I've yeah. seen situations where, you know, foundations are ready to fall and cause a whole house to crumble. And because of actions that have been taken by these DIYers that don't know what they're doing, there's only so much you can glean from a video or an article that you read. And yes, they show you the motions, but there's so many things. Every renovation is the same, but also at the same time is unique. Even I, who's been doing it for so long, you know, get stumbled and, and, and wonder and f- have to figure it out. One of, the, one of the middle names that people toss around at job size is problem solver. I love solving problems and renovations and rehabbing. Oftentimes is that trying to figure out the puzzle pieces to be able to complete the whole project successfully on time, on budget and of quality. And that's a lot of work, um, especially during remodel time, like on time is like everyone's time I've seen in my my history in real estate, like a lot of contractors, you know, they, they you know, give you, for example, four to six month estimate. But even then after that, it can become six to eight months plus. And, you know, there's permitting time, there's material time, there's other things that come into play when you, especially when you start putting up walls and doing renovations, because you're looking at, you don't see what's behind the scenes, like what past person, contractor or handyman has done something and you have to go fix their problems. So you're problem solving their problems that they didn't, you can see up front. So it just adds on to extend time, but homeowners get frustrated with that too, because you know homeowners don't always understand the work behind the scenes. Sure. And, and again, uh, I, I can't blame people because there's a lot of misinformation out there mm-hmm. on this, you know, in the cyberspace YouTube world and, you know, these, these DIY channels that you watch that, uh, you know, you just, all you got to do is grab a hammer and bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and I often said, uh, you know, for, I often said that uh, there should be a requirement, a licensing requirement to buy a hammer because I see so many times when people buy hammers, and, you know, these contractors that drive around with their little beat up pickup trucks that all of a sudden they kind of claim themselves to be contractors. They don't have they shouldn't buy. They shouldn't be allowed to buy that hammer because it caused more damage than good. Yeah, ex- exactly. And I think, you know, for real estate investors, you you learn a lot of things over time, especially when you start doing one first, second, third property. And even after the 10th to 100th property, there's always something to learn. Like, for example, you know, old houses, 1920 houses versus 2000 houses. You know, they're, the two by fours are different, right? They're like two and a half inches versus three and a half inches. But unless you know, you know, and then the wall's thinner than others. And then you start adding in plaster, the wiring mesh and everything else. It takes way more time and way more cost just to dump, right? But right. people don't realize that until they start opening up walls. And when you start touching it, the plaster lines come in play, right? Mm-hmm. And then the measurements for like a bathroom is like, a, what's the, you know, five by eight. But what happens when it becomes like a six and a half or, you know, the measurements of tubs, the measurements of your vanities, the measurements of placements, right? But people don't see that. No, people don't see that. And interesting, you brought that up. And I totally agree with you that, you know, when you watch these YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff, they don't take account of all those little nuances and variables that can exist in, mm-hmm. in, in, in projects all across North America that people start up by watching a t- YouTube video or a DIY show mm-hmm. and then realize, well, how come they didn't talk about this or that or that? Well, yeah. it's only a 30 minute show. There's only so much that they can include. And again, they're looking to romanticize the whole process. And if you've ever gone into, and I just, and I have a client uh, that I, that I just uh, signed up from uh, North Carolina, who who's gone through the whole process, who understands like you know they've done the DIY thing where they realize that you know this project that should have taken two three months ended up taking them eight, and mm-hmm. in that process they 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 they're, they've spent their weekends, their holidays, their you know vacations and evenings to try to do this renovation, and it's it takes a toll physically and emotionally. And you, by the end of it, you're like, I want to get, a, you know, I want to get me out of this, right? Yeah, I'm done. Get me out. <laughs> There's a lot more work than you think. It's dirty, yeah. and it's. But you don't see that in uh, Hollywood or the YouTube videos. It's all glorious and wonderful, mm-hmm. but it's not quite like that. Yeah, and yeah, especially on TV, you see how fast it is. Like, it's so fast to demo a place out, and like they're not showing you exact tools, and they probably already pre-cut everything up, so it's easy to demo. You know. 
right. on TV. Because yeah, you have 30 minutes to show the glamour side of things, but are they showing behind the scenes of all the exact calculations, measurements, things that happen? And then when you're buying product and it doesn't match a lineup, even your piping doesn't line up, what are you gonna do, right? Yeah, I like, I, I, and all this stuff is lots of dust, lots of debris. Uh, it's sweaty work, and you're, you know, just simply just cutting carpet out. Mm -hmm. It's a chore, and you yeah. got to go through a lot of bird, you know, or, or cat pee, you know, all that kind of stuff. When you go, it, it's just really not a, a fun process. But again, uh, yeah, we, you and I know about that, but a lot of folks that <laughs> haven't done it, you know, think that it's an easy process, but it's not. Exactly. And even calculation wise, for example, let's say that you start calculating material cost and timing and like even let's say tiling, you know, tiling is 12 by 24, for example, is current pretty standard rate, but some tiling is like 20, 23 and a half. You're actually wasting, if when you do a 12 inch cut, you're actually wasting the other side of it, but they don't realize that then you're going to start adding more than 10%, like 25% of material on top of the cost, right? And people sure. don't see that until you actually buy the product. And one thing I learned from contractors is that, you know, contractors are busy. It's not really like corporate product man project management they're just like they're doing the job they're doing everything they can but timing wise for example even today like hey windows take three months to order are you planning that ahead are you ordering from day one uh, metal pipe metal gates metal hand mailing takes eight to twelve weeks are you ordering that ahead of time but contractors might not not all contractors might not think hey you need to order these all pre front but sometimes you can't um, order front uh, in, in the beginning because you have to do certain things in phases before you can even get to there. But it delays sure. your your contracting timeline. But we don't always have to mention that because we don't want to worry you as a buyer uh, owner. Say, hey, you have to think about all these things up front and all these costs up front, right? Okay, fair enough. But you know, <laughs> part of the part of the uh, part of the process uh, <laughs> is that both sides need to be. Uh, uh, communicated educated and need to have to share that kind of information so that everybody knows and understands if, if that they're on the same page yeah. i often find that that there is a disconnect between what is proposed and what actually occurs and it creates a lot of animosity look i i'm a real estate investor but i'm also a general contractor so i've worn i've been on both sides where i have gone and quoted con uh, customers but also at the same time i've been quoted by contractors and tradespeople. So I know mm -hmm. the whole lay of the land and there's a lot of issues and uh, unfortunately surrounding both sides that could be cleared up and addressed. And one of the things, and that's one of the things that I, that I teach that I, that I, that I, that I engage people in and I explain to them and getting out that good word is that we can have a, a renovation, a rehab project that is on time, that is of a quality and that is going to be, um, you know, done, uh, uh, properly like everything's going to work out in the end but it's just a matter of you got to put in the systems and the processes in place to be able to achieve that and it starts from creating a goal and, and uh, you know things that i've developed over the course of uh, 30 years of successfully doing this you pick up on things like i it's second nature to me like that wall behind you matthew to knock it down and build it because i've mm -hmm. done so many mm -hmm. but for a lot of folks that are coming into the business you know on the real estate investor side or just regular homeowners you know, they don't know that. And there's only so much that, again, you can glean off of the YouTube videos and internet. And so it's a process that uh, that I've been able to develop that that will assure that from start to finish, you'll have a uh, renovation that will be on time, it'll be of quality, and it will be on budget. Yeah, that's the most important thing. And the one thing I learned about too, like I've been in real estate for over 14 years and done multiple properties already um, and re and rehabs. But one thing I learned too is like the communication part is a little, sometimes it's a little tricky because for example, when an investor buys a house or a buyer buys a house, your mortgage starts ticking, right? So you're going to have to start paying mortgage. But at the same time, you want to be moved in, you want to rent, rent it out. So that time is ticking right there. But when you start talking to contractors, you're trying to get multiple bids. There's not always clarity in it and they don't want to always spend time communicating with you back and forth exactly what you want because they you know of course their time is valuable and they want to get in and out of projects so the trade-off to that too is okay how do you calculate the cost for each different contractor how do you set exactly the same communication because for example let's say this a sliding door versus a bifold door has a different measurement on the finishing right not everyone knows that right and you have to be clear about that but when you're in contract, okay, you're gonna do closets, you're gonna do bathrooms, whatever. I'll give you all the general measurements, like general quote. But then when they start doing it during the project, there's a worker that are doing the work versus the contractor who is communicating with you. But if they're doing multiple jobs, they might not always remember to communicate these things with you. But also, most buyers are not may not be that sophisticated yet 
to understand the differences between all these specific nuances in construction. So mm -hmm. it's too late. And that just adds into your material cost to go rebuy everything. Yeah, but I, I, I disagree with you that you, is there, there isn't something that can be done yes. to alleviate all that. And, and, now, and what I teach and, uh, uh, to people is how to create a detailed scope of work where all of those issues and nuances you just described have already been identified. Meaning, if I, when I engage a real estate investor on a, you know, when they start a, before they start a renovation project, there's a process that we go through, but one of those is creating a detailed scope of work where you walk through the property and you've identified clearly what are the things that you're looking to accomplish, put in the processes associated with what you're looking to accomplish, accomplish, and then you've identified every single aspect of it in terms of you want a uh, you want a sliding door or do you want a French door? Do you want this particular color? Do you want this quality of paint? There's so many different variables that can be added or subtracted from the budget when you're putting together uh, a renovation project that you need to have all of that stuff figured out beforehand so that I get it to the point where, again, this is many years of putting together developing but i got it to a point where you've got it you get all the information programmed and that i can literally send this to any trade or general contractor and they have all the information in front of them that they can price it out without even jo visiting my job site without yep. visiting the project it could still come but they don't have to and by virtue of having provided that information uh it, it, it you entice uh, so many more general contractors and trades people to quote on your job because you, they have the information there. Also, it gives you, it gives that 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 contractor trace person uh, confidence in doing business with this person because this person is a professional. I'm going to yeah. tell you something, Matthew. I, uh, I I I'm very choosy in the people that I do business with, and all good trace people and contractors are. And we immediately, uh, we get phone calls all the time from people. Hey, can you please price this out for me? Can you do this for me? The process of me pricing something out is very laborious. It takes time. Mm -hmm. yep. There's a cost involved. And I can't just liberally pass out free information, free quotes to people. I don't do that. I, have, I know the people that I do business with. I have that. I have that group of people that I that I developed. But also, if there's something that comes in from the outside, I have my spidey senses pop up, and I know whether I'm dealing with a legitimate operator or not. And if I receive somebody giving me a detailed scope of work where they're giving me all the information and the measure and all that kind of stuff that I need to be able to put a quote together, trust me, I'm going to be highly inclined to price out your job versus somebody else who randomly calls me up and says, hey, can you come over here? Can you give me some free advice? Can you give me some free quotes? I'm not into that. <laughs> I've realized as a successful business owner, as a general contractor, that speed and efficiency is important to me. I go in, get my job done, I get paid, I move on to the other one. I do turnover. I can't get stuck. I, there's no money for me to get stuck with somebody while they hum and haw figuring out whether they want a sliding door or a French door, whether they want white or off-white in their house. Don't have time for that. So that's yeah. why when you get all those decisions put together and you put them in a document detailed and then you tender it out to people, trust me, it's amazing how many people are going to put their hand up in there and say, I want to work with you, Matthew. Does that make any sense? Nice. I'm glad you have that because most people don't even have that. Like a lot of contractors you talk to, they don't have a template for a buyer uh, owner to actually complete up. Um, it's good that you guys actually provide that kind of value there where you know, you're know you going from your experience and providing a list of template of here's everything you really want to think about when to really create a detailed line item uh, sheet so that way you can pass it out to contractors to get proper bidding because right now they're taking assumptions as well. If you're not clear on what you're doing, they're going to assume a little higher pricing too just to justify without adding in um, line item costs uh, and change orders so that's a part of it too and then yeah as, as an owner or investor you might not think of all these things especially on your first time you won't know what you don't haven't done before but once you start getting into it then you really become familiar with the process everything that goes on and all the little things intricately uh, built in so you can make it proper you know proper informed information when you're doing a redesign and that's well, hard listen, that's tough but matthew i i come from i come from the world and i've told you that i've worn uh, i've worn many different hats and i have bid on projects and completed projects on a residential and commercial side on the commercial side you will not walk into a renovation project without a detailed scope of work mm -hmm. where all the i's are dotted and t's are crossed 
and everybody knows what it is going to be happening throughout that project. Walk into the residential side of the world, the single family, small little multifamily, and it's like the wild, wild west. Nobody yeah. knows what the hell's going on. And I get these phone calls from good, decent people, scratch your head, wondering why nobody wants to come. Why won't a good quality trace person or contractor return my phone calls? Why? They're so busy. Yeah, they're busy, but they're not coming to you because you don't know what you want. And if once you've been able to clearly figure that stuff out, you will buy, you will get people. What you're going to attract by not having a detailed scope of work are those people that hang around Craigslist and at your local home improvement place, the losers, the people that don't know how they uh, how to run a, a proper business. And you're going to attract those people and you're going to sit there and muddle through, try to figure out how to do this project. And it ends up very acrimonious. By virtue of having a detailed scope of work, you will get many, many great quality people want to do the work, but also at the same time, you'll scare away, trust me, you'll scare away the riffraff because yeah. a riffraff will go, yeah. go, go look at that document and say, I don't want any part of this guy. He's too smart for me. And he'll just walk away and go to somebody else who doesn't have that. Yeah, and there are some guys, for example, there's always good and bad sides of everything, right? So there's some good, really good contractors who, who's going to really price you fairly, regardless of age, regardless of uh, anything. And then there are those who are trying to sell you too. Like I've seen quotes like double the price of any normal contractor who you actually know is really good, and they just randomly put that because they don't they think you're inexperienced. They don't they don't know what you know already, and they just take, try to take advantage of that too. So it's really good to really get multiple quotes, but really provide a detailed um, information so that they, you can make an informed decision on pricing and make it fair. Everyone. Yep. I, and, and that is having quotes all, all over the place shows me that one, you haven't done your due diligence in terms of creating a detailed scope of work or identifying the people that you even want to, uh, uh, you know, have quote on your job. Again, if you go out there with with a with a machine gun and start shooting around trying to find somebody, yeah, you might nail a good person, but also might nail a bad person. But if you if you know where you're going, what you're doing again is process and systems. It's amazing how efficient my jobs don't go over budget. My jobs, my projects don't go that you know, horribly like in terms of quality and and you know, time over. No, everything is done. Within the scope, within what we want to accomplish over there, and we he, we hit our milestones, we hit our KPIs. Um, and when I hear people that can't, even even this situation, what we're going through right now with an overheated real estate market, with contractors, trade people running around, they're busy. Everybody's busy. I'm still hitting my targets because I know what I'm doing because I've got systems and processes in place to ensure that I shepherd the whole process of renovating, rehabbing a property to fruition. And I nail my KPIs. Well, for example, you know, you're a good general contractor. You, you're able to do that. Not all, even some of the good general contractors, for example, sometimes they'll take on more projects than they, they want to take on. Or sometimes they just see that money and they'll take those on. But the, at the same time, those other projects that are doing it the, simultaneously, they'll do change orders as well. So then it starts creating delay in processes for multiple houses, especially when they're having a small crew, because even contractors I talked to today, they're mentioning they're having a tough time hiring enough people to work because they don't, they don't want to work right now. Right. So that's well, a Matthew, challenge too. Matthew, I appreciate that. And uh, yes, there are definitely strains in the marketplace right now, but mm -hmm. I can, I, there is a mechanism, again, a process that I initiate and I educate and teach people on to ensures that, uh, that, that that the work is their job is done versus somebody else's. So give you an example. Again, I'm a general contractor and I work on multiple jobs and we have delays here, issues there, or there. I, uh, I, it's amazing how money plays a part in my decision on where I work and where I don't work. Oftentimes I find good, decent folks who don't know much will go out and give 50 percent deposits to, to contractors and trace people who haven't done anything and expect them to show up, expect them to do work. And meanwhile, these guys are bouncing around other jobs. Where are they going to go work? Are they going to go work where they've already been paid or are they going to work where somebody owes them money? We, we unfortunately, what is happening right now is that uh, there's uh, people just don't know any better. They give up too much money, and they, as a result, they give up control. And when you give up control, this is what happens. I heard so many horror stories. Of, of uh, there's one instance of a client of mine who told me about a situation where they were doing a renovation, 
and the contractor didn't show up for a couple of days, weeks. And, and they go to they go to the their local home improvement, a Home Depot, and they see the guy there buying stuff. He's like, what are you doing over here? He's like, guys, uh, the contractor's like, oh, well, I'm just buying stuff for your pro for your project. I'll be there in a couple hours. The guy mm -hmm. never showed up. Yep. The guy's working. You know, uh, you know, there's a, the, these people are working, but they're making decisions on where they're going to work. And trust me when I say that if I owe you money, you're going to come and do work. And so you have to set up a payment schedule. This is what I teach. A payment schedule where there's milestones that are hit. When you hit a milestone, you get paid. You hit a, get a milestone, you get paid. I, I, I can't stand this whole notion that we're going to give money up front before we get a service provided. Yeah. These guys are not contractors and tradespeople are not like McDonald's where you got to go in, pay your money and get, you know, wait off to the side to get your hamburger. No, 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 no. There's no, none of these contractors and trade people, including me is like McDonald's. You pay when you get, when you perform the service, you provide a service, you get paid, you provide a service, you get paid. And that is how you get into a situation assist be, being able to ensure accountability and making sure that people do their job. And the, I, I would say the challenge with this is this too, like when you're out there like trying to find referrals, a lot of referrals you call like are super busy. Like some of my friends are contractors and they're like, hey, I'm booked for the next two years. I'm like two years, wow, that's hard to work with, right? You're booked and goes, yeah, I just can't help you right now. And then there's those out there who will be say, hey, I'll help you right now. But you know, of course we need 20% deposit up front so we can buy materials and like, yeah, you don't, really, you don't really need that, but you're gonna ask for that, right? And then there's some good people who are honest, people who wanna help you first and get paid afterwards like normal and be fair but the challenging part for a buyer investor is like the pressure of you know, balancing it and also understanding it and learning like it's not easy to find people like you who are going to help and also like you know information online where you can actually get resources on how to perform due diligence and how to get like you know, templates and contracts set up properly in the payment structure properly so i'm glad you guys are doing that you guys uh, mentioned like um through the renovation institute that you guys are helping homeowners learn how to successfully manage their own home renovations instead of like you know directly hiring a contractor and then you're trying to provide benefits on how to manage the renovation but be even before then when i first started i didn't have all that access to these things no, of course. And and look, it, it goes something like this. Either you're going one way or another, you're going to pay. Either you're going to pay up front where you have somebody that's going to help you through the process or you're going to pay through the mistakes and delays and issues that you're going to confront those sleepless nights. And there's so many situations when I come across clients that tell me about, you know, a bad renovation that they've already gone through and, and the you know, waking up every morning, expecting that contractor to show up and he doesn't. And that yep. pit in your stomach every morning, hoping that that guy is going to show up to do some work and he doesn't or she doesn't. And then how painful it is and, you know, and, and anxiety that it is created every single morning waiting for this person. That, you know, 10 week project that turns into 18, 20 and the monies that are involved. You know, sometimes, you know, as real estate investors, we're borrowing money at very high interest rates to get our job done. Hard money lenders we go to, right? And you know, every you know, that twelve percent that you're paying on a monthly basis is painful. And the rental income that you don't get out of that property, it's painful. And the, all the other expenses associated with that renovation is painful. You know, the whole notion, this whole idea of renovations, people have to understand and appreciate that it's it's not a fun process. Like the whole idea is very ironic. But in order for you to take a property that you paid, as an example, $100,000, and you think that through renovations, you can get it up to $150,000. And that's the whole idea. We're always buying ugly ducklings, diamonds in a rough, where we got to do some type of renovation or improvement to it to be able to raise the value. The ironic part is that when you buy that property at $100,000, you got to beat it up. You got to rip it apart. You got to rip out the kitchen or the bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. By virtue of doing that, you're actually, Matthew, decreasing the value of the property. Th think about it. If I were to grip out the part and all those things in that house and I called up a, a property mm -hmm. appraiser, what are mm -hmm. they going to value the property at? They're going to yeah. value it less than that 100000 that you paid for it. And then on top of that, we have to spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars in that property to put that kitchen bathroom back in place so that we can raise a value up to hundred to, to pass what we paid. So those are, you know, th there's a lot of anxiety and apprehension to that process, right? Yeah. So I understand where people are coming from, where they're, you know, they're hesitant and they're worried. And, uh, and then, you, you, don't, you know, you, there's a horror stories that everybody has heard about, you know, contractors that grab deposits and disappear, especially nowadays. 
or mm-hmm. they do such inferior work that you got to rip it all apart and it's going to cost you three or five times more now to you know do it all over again never mind the time so i get it i understand what's happening out there and and i and i it's amazing uh the reception that, that that i've gotten all across north america of people that put their hand up in the air and said hey please come and help me show me the way and there is a way there, there's there's a, lot, there's a lot of nuggets that i've given out in this dialogue this conversation a lot of, i hopefully just put you know made people think about things differently like why should you give up a 50% deposit to a, co- to a contractor who is this who is this person mm-hmm. what do they do why do they need you go try that matthew where or anybody who's listening to this to this podcast this interview go try that tomorrow or on monday go to your employer and say, Mr. Employer or Mrs. Employer, I would like you to pay me ahead of time for two weeks or a month. And then I'll just, you know, I'll perform my work, of course, but pay me ahead of time. What do you yeah. think your employer is going to say? They're going to laugh. <laughs> yeah, they're going to laugh at you and say, what, what's the matter with you? Maybe you need to maybe you need to go visit a shrink or you need to go visit a doctor, get some medication. But yet contractors and tradespeople do that to 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 investors, to homeowners all the time. Give me 50%. I've heard even 70%. Wow. Too much. And they're forking over, Matthew. They're writing a check of 70%. That's a lot of money, man. Mm-hmm. And to give you that, give it to somebody that you really don't know, uh, I don't know. I, I'd never do that. <laughs> that's that that just doesn't happen with yeah. my with me. So Glad that's one of the things I it. teach. That's one of the things I teach. That's one of the things that I educate people on. And it's amazing the reception I've gotten across North America where people are like, yeah, you're right. And it's like a light being shown on the whole industry. And again, I'm speaking as a general contractor, a very successful one. Uh, there, there's a way for win-win situations here where you have the real estate investor or the homeowner and the contractor trades people. We can create situations where everybody understands where we're all coming from and we put all the, but that's a responsibility of not only the trades person and contractor, but it's also the real estate investor and homeowner. You need to create goals. You need to create needs and wants lists. You need to create scopes of work and you need to have payment schedules. You need to have and all that stuff. It needs to be put in place and, I have, like I said, projects that come in on time, on budget, and are done of quality. Let's talk about that. So, for example, let's start from the beginning of this thing. So, in the beginning, like, for example, I'm a buyer right now. You're the contractor. I'm going to go buy a house, and, you know, I don't know exactly when I'm going to get the house, but if I come across a great deal, it might be in two weeks, it might be in 30 days, it might be in six months, but I don't know. But let's say, for example, I just get in contract today, and I found a house. It's going to close in 30 days. What should I do next if I know I'm going to remodel it? Well, hopefully you've done enough due diligence in the area that you're looking to purchase the property. So yeah. you have a good idea and sense of what it is that you need to uh, buy this, do to this property in order to be able to, to do whatever you're doing. Like there's my, there's a variety of different types of real estate investors. There's your buy and hold guys. There's your fix and flips. There, there, there's lots of different things out there. So you got to establish clearly what your goals are for this particular property. And once you've been able to establish that goal, for example, I'm looking to rent apartment, uh, the house out for $1,500 a month, or I'm looking to renovate it and flip it for, you know, make $100,000. That's great. You have that goal, write it down, and then you got to get out there in the marketplace and validate that. Meaning, what is it that I have to do to this property in order to be able to get me to that goal? And a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people don't get into the minutia and the details, into the weeds to figure out all that stuff. It's amazing how much information can be gleaned if you spend a couple of hours actually visiting properties that have sold for that particular dollar or prop or you know, property is being rented for a particular value. And you understand, oh, they have a dishwasher. Oh, they have curtains that they're providing. Oh, that house had a swimming pool. Oh, that had a house had some really cool landscaping. All that information needs to be sort of digested. And so that you understand what it is that you need to accomplish with the property that you're acquiring. Now, the difficult part in establishing a budget for all of these things, and when you're looking at it, is that, you know, so it's, a, it's a situation where, uh, which one is it? The chicken or the egg comes first. Because mm-hmm. on one hand, you need to have the level of experience and understanding that you walk into a property and be able to assess what it needs to be done and how much it's going to cost and the time involved. But you need to have that experience to be able to put a dollar value. But on the other hand, there's a lot of investors who will go out there who don't have that. But they need a value. They need a dollar figure to be able to determine what the cost is for that renovation, right? You need to put that number in to figure out whether it's worthwhile to purchase that investment or not. So I I have like developed uh, 
and good successful real estate investors because they don't they've developed systems and processes. And one of them is I developed a renovation calculator so that I immediately when I walk into a property, Matthew, I'm able to survey it and I'm able to identify the things that I need to get done. And I click, click, click on this calculator of mine and it spits out a number that I can use to determine whether it's worthwhile for me to go move forward on this deal or not. And it also requires a level of experience and expertise to be able to walk through a property and really figure out what it is that you need to get to do and not. I've done thousands of these, so I got that. Unfortunately, new real estate investors don't. And so they rely on a house inspector or they rely on a, pro, a, a, a contractor to come in and give them a, qu a, a quote. But the problem is that you only, if on a great deal, you've only got a couple of hours to be able to make that deal, especially in this overheated market. And if you can't come up with a figure, figure that out, it's off. You're going to lose deal after deal after deal. There's no way a great deal is going to give you, you know, a window of seven days to figure it out, you know, come back, you know, uh, clauses that will give you an opportunity to back out. These are firm deals. When you got to come across a great deal, you got to be firm or you're not. They're just going to move on to somebody else who knows what they're doing. Yeah. So it's a catch. It's a it's a it's a. It's one of the things that I talk about all the time about, you know, being a successful real estate investor is that you need to have two skill sets. You need to, one, be able to find a great deal. But I say more importantly, the second skill set you need is you better know how to renovate and evaluate that component, the renovation portion, uh, portion of the, the whole uh, process, because that is one that is the most difficult and can be the most uh, problematic for people. Because I can give you a great deal, Matthew. But through the process of you not knowing what you're doing in terms of that renovation, that great deal could turn into a disaster. And I've seen it time and time again. How many times have you driven through neighborhoods where you've seen a garbage dumpster sitting in front of a property? It's been there for six months, seven months, eight months. I yeah. see it all the time. I drive by and I and I feel badly for these people. That's the reason why I've got involved in mentoring people, because I know what that person is going through right now. I know the frustration. I know the pain that they're going through because they don't know what they're doing. They're being taken advantage of and money is going out the window. And, uh, you know, this whole hopes and dreams of creating a real estate portfolio, portfolio get dashed and they get destroyed because of one investment that went awry. I gave them a great deal. You can have a great deal, but you can screw it up with a renovation that has gone bad. Yep. So it, it, it's it's hard. Like I said before, it's you know the chicken or the egg, which comes first. And and again, um, I always <laughs> I always big, I'm a big fan of mentorship. Like I have spent in my lifetime. And the reason why I'm successful as I am is because I have spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of 30 years through coaching, mentorship, seminars, books, you name it. I've done that. And every little one of them, I've been able to grab a nugget and incorporate it in my life. And as a result, I believe that I've received, I've, I've accomplished what I've accomplished because of the investment that I made, not in my, not in properties, but in myself. That's where you get the most value is investing in yourself. And that's where I've seen, that's where I've gotten my successes from. And it's similar to, I've, I've mentioned this many times. It's like you trying to learn how to play a guitar or how to pl uh, play a piano. What are you going to do? Can you go and learn how to play guitar and piano on your own? Can you watch YouTube videos and read books and go on the internet? Yeah, you could probably do that. It'll take you many, many years. It'll take you, you know, lots of mistakes and difficulties and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, get to the point where you can play that song. Versus hiring a music teacher, a guitar teacher, a piano teacher, somebody who knows what they're doing, and they sit right beside you and they teach you right away how to hold a guitar, how to strum that, you know, the keys on the piano, how to position yourself. Wouldn't you be able to learn? To how to play that instrument in a lot quicker fashion wouldn't yeah. the process be a lot more funner and uh, and how quickly like it's 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 much more enjoyable and so what are the things that you want to do like I, i've saw uh, that's why i have a strong proponent that if you want to get something done in life go hire somebody who's already done it and just copy it's so much easier but there's a cost involved of course there is but isn't there a cost matthew isn't there a cost if you buy that property and you screw up on the deal isn't yep. there a cost if you buy that, renovate that property and you screw up on a renovation? You know how much a renovation, if I were to give you 500 square feet of tile and you lay them and they're all screwed up, do you know how much it costs for you to rip out that tile, buy new tile, and how much time you add it to your schedule? A lot. Thousands, yep. thousands of dollars. And I'm just one wrong move, a little one. 
And there's a lot bigger ones that you can create in a renovation. So I'm a huge proponent and I, and I will, I'm advocating until I'm blue in the face. If you really want to get serious on something, align yourself with people who've done it, who are successful at it. And if you've got to pay, pay, because it's a lot more efficient to do it that way versus you trying to figure it out on your own. And I think it comes back down to like mindset, really, because people want to buy a house. You have money to buy a house. You do have money for mentorship, and you really should utilize that in some sense with someone in locally who has done it with you, or who has done it and has a proven experience. Because yeah, you really do run into a lot of issues trying to do it yourself because you really don't know what you don't know. You haven't seen it before. You haven't opened everything up, and you don't know who you're working with. You really need a trusted team. Like you need the proper vendors. You need the team. You need an understanding. You need you need a really good real estate agent who understands that that investing side, the flipping side, the development, the timelines, and really real working with realistic people like when i work with my clientele we help them from start to finish but they really have a good understanding because you know we've done a lot of this before and we show them examples and talk to the right people and we get multiple bids on it but even then nothing's perfect because you don't know until you open it up and see how much damage there is but there's a lot of money that could be saved but if you're not going for this with experience and you're just going for for example any agent any new agent who's just helping you and you haven't done this before it can be quite expensive and you're not really knowing if you're getting into a great deal because you don't know the cost involved yeah when you walk the building you got to really understand the cost structure of the building when you walk it the first time because time is the essence and if you're finding a great deal or something off market too you got to know how much time and cost it will take to get the project done and at the end of the day after all calculations are you really making money how long and how long will it take and what's the risk factor on that deal especially in the Bay area matthew absolutely <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna say something right now there are people who are gonna who are listening right now that uh have watched all the youtube videos and have read all the articles and burr strategy and flicks and flip and all that kind of stuff and a year from now will be in the exact same position that they are today. Yep. And they'll never ever get off the fence. And one of the great things about taking that, that great leap forward is having somebody, a mentor, somebody that's going to be right beside you to guide you through the process and navigate you through these troubled waters and sometimes coddle you and sometimes kick you in the ass. And mm -hmm. it's going to get you to the point where you want to be a year from now. But there's so many people are watching right now that wish and they will, they're, they're, they're ready to go. They're, uh, 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 but they don't do anything. They're never able to get off the fence. And that's 80% uh, of the people out there are like that. And there's only about 20% that actually are willing to take the investments in themselves to make forward. And those are the people that a year from now are going to have two, three properties and be like, wow. And then all of a sudden, those same people, if they just continued on that road, all of a sudden they create a real estate portfolio that's created financial freedom that they don't have to worry about bills. They don't have to worry about their jobs. And they could pass down to their next generation, their sons and daughters or whatever, uh, this portfolio that's going to continue to give on giving. It's going to give continue to give income. And it's an amazing, beautiful process. But I wish that more people got serious and willing to take that leap of faith and get out of their comfort zone. I think real estate investing, especially passive income investing, active income, multi units. I love I love multi units, right? And building this um, portfolio is really make adds a tremendous amount of value. It's actually creating generational wealth with tax benefits, and really people need to really think about it and look into it and see why all the big companies, even institutions, are really investing in real estate. Um, but b before we end the show, actually, I have about 10, 12 minutes on. I want to talk about like. In the past 30 years, you learned a lot. And how can we help these guys, investors, new investors, seasoned investors, really get moving even in 2021? Like, what are the main steps we need to take action on? And how do we do it properly? How do we renovate properly and do things correctly? And how do we avoid all of the common pitfalls that you see? Well, I, as I touched on it, like it, it, there's are there's a process uh, mm -hmm. that I that I have uh, developed that I, that 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 it's gone through trial and error and and, and it starts with creating, as I touched on earlier, goals. You need to really establish a goal for what this particular renovation or investment, whatever you're doing, you need to have a goal. And once you have that goal, you need to get in there and figure out and validate it and make sure that this goal is, is even accomplishable. Like, what is it that you need to do in order to be able to get to it? And once you've been able to get that, the next step is uh, I, I budget. Where is, is the money going to come from for this purchase, for this renovation? And there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of sources that folks, investors, and homeowners don't realize exist to them to be able to uh, go out there and make a purchase. There are opportunities for people to purchase properties with zero down. 
It does exist. This is not hocus pocus. This is not, you know, one of those late night telemarketer kind of TV shows for 30 minutes where they flash Rolls Royces and pretty women. No, no, no. This actually is true. It is possible. But you need to understand the process of how to do it. And it's and some of it can be gleaned from YouTube videos, stuff like that. But there's also a lot of it that needs to come from, you know, mentorship of people who know how to go about doing that. But anyways, back to like the renovation side, mm -hmm. if we're going to create a system for it. But once you've determined a budget and that uh, where to get the, where the money's from come from, it could come from hard money lenders, uh, which I talked about. Uh, there's uh, you know lines of credit that can be established on a home, second uh, uh, mortgages, but also in particular, one of the resources that a lot of folks uh, don't really tap into is that you got to look into your municipal, uh, wherever you live, the municipal uh, government, because sometimes there are opportunities where the government will give you money to be able to do a particular renovation or rehab to a to a property. Like I've I've tapped into it for the replacement of sewer lines and the downspouts because because uh, the municipal government wanted us to disconnect from the storm sewers and they wanted us to have naturally water dissipate in the in the into the ground. And, and that was a good seven thousand dollars worth of money that I didn't have to spend that came from the government. So right. these are the types of things that people need to look into. Um, once you've been able to figure out that component, then you need to create a needs and wants list. And that's one of the things that I kind of touched on that I'll go elaborate more. Oftentimes that I find new real estate investors or just people in general, they just over renovate their properties and, and, and they go into, they go into and looking at things that they're, they're renovating things that they shouldn't. So one, one of the processes that I, that I engage people in is to create a needs and wants list where uh, you have a sheet of paper and on one side of the ledger are needs. And these are things that need to be done. So, for example, if you have a, a leak in a roof, you need to have that. That's a need that needs to be repaired. If you have a broken window and the elements are coming in, that needs to be repaired. That's a need. Wants are things like carpeting that, for, that can be in the, in the living room that maybe might be not as desirable in color or condition, but it's still something that can be serviceable. It's not a trip hazard. It's not going to cause any 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 harm to somebody. Those are things that you would put on the one side. And the whole purpose behind this list is that when we've, uh, we figure out we need the things that we need to do, and if there's enough money in the budget, then we address the certain things that are on the one side to be able to, to, be able to uh, look after because at the end of the day, the reason why we establish a goal and it's our driving force, it's our guiding light, is to make sure that every action, every move that we make is to go to that goal, to accomplish that goal. So that's why it's important to establish a goal. And then we're in the process of creating a needs and want list, we determine what are the things that we need to get done in order to be able to get us to that goal. And part mm -hmm. of that thing is maybe you might have to live with that carpet that's in the living room that's, you know, lime green. And, uh, and those are some of the things that choices that we have to live with to be able to make. Uh, once we've been able to style, uh, create that needs and wants list, we then move on to the most, uh, the, the most misunderstood, which is the detailed scope of work. When I create a detailed scope of work, these are literally a blow by blow account of what is being done in the exterior and interior of the property, where I itemize every single room that needs to have work done specify the process of what I'm looking to accomplish, specifications as for the color, the light bulbs, whatever you want to put in that pro in that particular room, and we break it down into the trades associated with it. The whole idea that by going through that process is that once we have that detailed scope of work, every discipline is broken down, and so the electrician, the plumber, or the general contractor who's going to look at the whole document is able to segment the or go to that particular uh, section that's pertinent to them and be able to understand what this renovation uh, is about and be able to price it out accordingly. Because part of the process of me completing this detailed scope of work is to provide some types of measurements, pictures, plans, drawings, things of that sort, specifications of particular appliances that might be pertinent to the whole renovation project. Those things need to be figured out. You should not leave anything to chance. You shouldn't leave this types of things later on to figure out. You need to have all that stuff figured out beforehand. And then once you've got that document, then you need to figure out who and where do you go to tender this document out. Oftentimes, I feel people, I find people, oh, I'm just going to go on Craigslist or Kijiji or you know one of these online things, Reddit, and I'm just going to post and I'll find people on there. 
And no, 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 that's the worst place. That's the last <laughs> place you go. If you know what you're doing, you can go to places like that. I could go there, no problem, because I know exactly what I got to get. And I know if this person knows what they're talking about, not, you know, they don't know what they're doing. But if you don't know, then you need to start from a level of people, hopefully in the, in the process of you trying to be a successful real estate investor, you've created some sort of a power team, relationships in the industry from, you know, other real estate investors, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, insurance brokers, people that are in the community that you create relationships with, wholesalers. All these guys will have people that they know from the electrician, the plumber, the painter that you need to get those references from. That's the best sort of people, places where you need to get your, uh, you know, the best people from to be able to have them price out your work. And those are the people that you tender it out and you give them the document. And it's amazing when these people receive this document, they immediately put you in a different category as the, than the rest of the 90% of phone calls that they get from people. They immediately see that these guys are professional. Here's a scope of work. It tells exactly what this person wants to accomplish in this project. Gives me specifications, details, measurements. All that is very simple, easy peasy. I look at the document, I can price it out. Every good contractor can do that. Every good mm -hmm. trace person can do that. And yeah. so if by virtue of doing that, you've identified great people, people with references, and then once you've and then they're going to be interested in quoting your work. So then you'll get these quotes coming in. Once you've gotten these quotes, then you start to do your due diligence, meaning you look at the actual quote itself and there's things that you need to look for and make sure that they're included and not included. You have to keep an eye on. But once you, you start the process of doing your due diligence, meaning you might even have to go visit particular job sites to ensure yourself that this person is the real deal, that this person is a good electrician. And part of that is you visit the job sites of other these other places, look at the condition of the job site. Maybe you strike up a conversation with the principal that's involved in that project, the person, that particular property owner, find out, hey, is this general contractor okay? How's been your relationship with them? Look at the job site, ask these questions. And then you put yourself in a happy and a great position to be able to be confident in the decision you make and who you want to use and not use. And then from there, once you've established the people, the parties you want to do business with, then Matthew, you start the, the dialogue of putting together a payment schedule establishing clear milestones and really create a Gantt chart. You know, you slide in these people to dialogue, figure out who needs what, where, what, how, why. And that is your, is the process that everybody is into and understands what needs to happen with the modern, with the beautiful things of the you know, technology is developed. It's not an issue for us to be able to do. Okay. Nice. I would say, I, I completely agree. I think exactly those are the proper steps there. And I think sometimes what I see people run into is like, oh, the contractor's too busy. He doesn't want to walk through all this stuff. He doesn't want to um, price everything out or he doesn't want to, um, you know, sit there and even though, because they don't have the contract yet, they're not the contractor yet. And you, I, they know you're bidding on multiple people. They're not spending the time. Cause like you mentioned earlier, it's a lot of work to do this upfront and give you that. But even though you have proper scope of work, then you're actually weeding out the people who are too busy for you then if they're not going to sit there and do the work and give you the estimate because you already gave them a detailed estimate. The second part about that too, I would ask you before we end the show is that how about contracts, like the contractor between the principal and the contractor, what do you see there? What should um, investors, new investors, buyers should look out for in that? Like, for example, there's no prepayment, there's no penalty fee if they delay. Sometimes some, you don't see that. You don't see certain things they put on there and what kind of exclusions. Uh, there's so many different clauses that should be insured in an agreement that I can spend another hour talking about <laughs> yeah. it. But just a, just a, just a couple, uh, a couple of little uh, nuggets that I can uh, toss your way. Um, one, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a proponent of including penalties for, for, for delays. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm not is because you give sort of a way out to your general contractor trace person when you put a clause in that says I'm going to penalize you a hundred dollars a day for doing work because now you've given them something that. They've already done the calculations behind the scenes, figuring, okay, if I can't meet the deadline of this person or this project, I, you know, it's going to cost me $100 in, in, in you know, continuing on. I don't like doing that. What I like to do is just, you have the clause insert that says you have the right to terminate the agreement because the services haven't been rendered by a particular date. That way, now you've got a gun to that person's head. The proverbial gun, meaning mm -hmm. if they don't get to that deadline, now they don't know. They, they don't know what's going to happen. You can say, hey, this is the agreement we agreed on and goodbye. I'm not going to pay any more money. You failed. 
before they, they before that gets to, po- that, to that point, you're going to see how quickly they're going to do everything they can to make sure that the project is completed. Their, their, their component is, or they're going to enter into negotiations negotiations with you, and they're going to say to you, "Okay, oh, I can meet it by the 15th, but I can do it by the 30th." Mm-hmm. And then you negotiate. Okay, well, in consideration for me to give you an extra two weeks, I need you to do this, or I need you to do that. And there's a give and take. By virtue of you saying, oh, I only want $100, $100 a day, whatever that figure is, you're giving them a way out. And it's not really, I, that's my, my, my preferences. I, as a general contractor, look at agreements like that, much rather have the $100 thing, Majig, and I know what the detail the, that, of that is versus the great unknown. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to push to get a project completed quicker than, uh, than one that has a specified penalty. Yeah, or sometimes they cut. Cor- some people will cut corners too if they know. Okay, I'm gonna hit that. I'm not gonna hit that deadline. I'm just gonna cut corners all the way through the rest of it. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's mm-hmm. a. Re- but there's a reason why you also have to have a detailed scope of work that ensures mm-hmm. that they're gonna perform the work. You know, the processes and the quality work and all that kind of stuff. If somebody's gonna cut a corner, cu- cut a corner. They're gonna cut a corner no matter what. And those mm-hmm. aren't the people we want to do business with. So, yeah, I, it cuts both ways in that regard. Another yeah. thing that I want to also just quickly is. You know, uh, making sure that you have clauses inserted that if there's any damages associated with your particular property or a neighboring property, you know, there's a situation that happened where a contractor or a trace person was praying uh, the outside the exterior of a house and that's paint spray ended up on a neighbor's car. Now, who's responsible for that? You, because they are your agents legally are responsible to make sure now you do re- you make restitution to your neighbor's car. But if you don't have that and if you don't have that clause within the agreement, that says, hey, if you're you're going to be responsible, and I can have the right to deduct X amount of dollars associated with your off of your final payment. If you don't have that, you can't just arbitrarily decide to withhold money from a tradesperson or a contractor. So these are types of diff- lots of different clauses that should be inserted to safeguard. This is serious business, Matthew, and mm-hmm. and oftentimes, you know, a lot of people uh, don't realize that one wrong move and can be really. Uh, there's a reason why there's horror stories out there. Yeah, I completely agree. And I really appreciate your time going through all these uh, things in regards to the construction and remodeling and things that people should look out for. Because I really you know, respect the buyers, investors who are putting their effort and hard-earned money into this. And I really want them to be taken care of and do things properly with the right people who are actually watching out for their best interests as well, principal duties, you know, fiduciary, things like that. Not always out there. But for example, where can they go to learn more about you, what you do, and how you can help them in making sure they ensure the right decisions on doing remodeling projects uh, regardless across the country? Well, I, I've uh, I, I've got a website that's fansturgeon.com where I've got a number of articles that have been published uh, uh, throughout the um, through, throughout the, you know different areas. I've been on many, many podcasts where I've been interviewed like uh, with people like yourself. I've got a couple of ebooks that I've uh, that I've written that people are more w- w- welcome to go on my website to download and gives them a good idea and understanding of who I am and what it is that how to structure a real proper renovation rehab for your uh, investment uh, property or just your property in general. And if folks are looking out to reach out to me, uh, there's my email that uh, can send me uh, an email or they can reach out to me through Facebook and social media. I, I'm really passionate about what I about this. I, I do this because I really enjoy engaging new real estate investors and real estate investors really want to learn the business to be successful and start somewhere and actually ultimately scale. Like the many ty- many people that I've had engaged and have had been fortunate enough to be able to engage with, we you know they started with nothing and have portfolios that that's generating them. You know, it's created financial freedom for them, and I love I love that. I, I I and it's really I'm really passionate about it. It really fills my soul. It's my it's my new why. So that, that's what I I'm out there. And I, if anybody needs information or help, by all means, reach out to me. I'll do what I can to help you out. Perfect. Thank you so much, Van, for being on our show. And for everyone out there, check out our podcast, The Truth About Real Estate. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Have a great day.